Good morning and welcome to Access. My name is Carol Yip and I serve as the administrator. We are a church that seeks to live life with God in soul, community, and mission. We're so glad that you could join us this Sunday and I hope that you'll be blessed by the service and by worship, um, that God will speak to you and that you would find yourself growing closer to him and to those in our community. Um, we have a great service lined up for you this morning. First, we'll be led in worship by Jessica Lewis. Uh, after that, we'll be treated to a video uh, promoting our Faith Village Pledge, which I hope that all of you will find the time to participate in. Um, next, Grace Chow will be leading us in our announcements and keeping us up to date with what's going on at Access. And then Ted will be delivering our sermon as he continues our series of Fall Afresh. Um, and then after that, don't go too far because we'll also be showing a video that promotes our spring small groups. Um, I also hope that you will consider joining one of those. Again, thank you so much for joining us this Sunday, uh, and I'll see you over in the chat box. Good morning, Access. I'm Jessica. Let's enter into a time of worship this morning. God, thank you for this space. Thank you for this time that we set aside to worship you, to bring our praises. Lord, lay bare our hearts, our minds, renew us and transform us. We want to be like you. Thank you, God.
thank you for your overwhelming love, God. Lord, may every heart know this truth. We are loved by you. And Lord, not only are we loved, Lord, but you love everyone.
hearts full of love and compassion. Hi, Axis. My name is Victor. Hi, Axis. I'm Tina Kim. Hi, Axis. I'm Josh. Hi, Axis. I'm Elaine. Hey, Axis. Uh, I'm John. This year, I'm committing to reading or listening to the Bible every single day. This year, I'm committed to spending less time on my phone and spending more time reading. Um, this year, I am going to commit to journaling more regularly so that um, it gives me a chance to reflect and think and process my thoughts and hopefully um, grow more this year. This year for my Faith Village Pledge, I want to pursue a discipleship of the mind more intentionally. So I'm going to commit to reading um, a book, any book, um, for at least five minutes a day. I'm pleased to say that I've read three books so far this year and they weren't picture books. So I hope to continue doing that. This year, I'm committing to not maximizing all of my time. I want to create space so I can be interruptible when God is moving. What about you? 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 That was great hearing about some of the commitments that people are wanting to make. I hope that you'll consider what God might be inviting you to commit to. And Jessica, thank you so much for leading us in worship. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Access. My name is Grace Chow, and I just wanted to direct your attention to some announcements this morning. First, uh, if you're joining us for the first time or new to Access, welcome. Would you please consider filling out a Connect card online? That's a great first step to stay in touch and keep up to date with what's going on at Access. Just visit accesslive.org and click the I'm new button. Our next on-ramp is Sunday, February 7th from 11 to 12 p.m. via Zoom. On-Ramp is a chance for people newer to access to get to know a little bit more about our church, and we'd love for you to join us. Register online by February 1st. Also, if you call Access your home church, then we want to encourage you to sign up for our mission partner class. You'll learn more about what it means to commit to Access as a member. This class discusses our vision, theology, and how we approach discipleship. Our next mission partner class is Sunday, February 7th from 1 to 3 p.m. Again, please sign up online. We also have some really great spring groups uh, being offered. Most will meet online, although some will meet outside. Some will be going deep into the scriptures, Others will be using a book, but what they all have in common is that these are spaces where you can connect with others and deepen your life with God. Uh, the deadline to sign up for some of these groups is this Sunday, so please take a look at the list of um, opportunities and sign up today. Next Sunday, we'll be gathering live on Zoom for our Faith Village Sunday. We'll have worship, hear a message, and have a time of sharing and prayer around our Faith Village commitments. So, and we'll also be taking communion together. So please join us. Finally, 
parents, we have a great interactive class online both before and after our Sunday live stream. Email Pastor Grace for more information. And now let's do the children's blessing together. If you would say this with me, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. And now before Ted gives a message, we have a pretty simple question. What's a book that you've read recently that you would like to recommend or a book that's on your reading list that you would like to uh, engage in? Please put your answer in the chat box below. Good morning, and thanks for joining today. We are on message number three, introducing our teaching theme for 2021. You know, each year at Access, we introduce a teaching theme to help shape and guide us along the way as we follow after Jesus into a new year. And this year, our theme is Fall Afresh, Faith for a New Day. We're focusing on the Holy Spirit and paying attention to the guidance, the counsel, the promptings, and the nudges that we get from the Holy Spirit, and we're learning to respond in faith. And this year, our teaching theme comes from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, which states, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. We've been repeating this verse each week, and we're going to do that again today as we wrap up uh, our message. But today, really what we're focusing on is the theme of love. Now, a couple of weeks ago when we introduced the theme, we talked about this dynamic that happened at Pentecost, a day in history when the Holy Spirit came in power upon the early church. There was a violent wind, there were tongues of fire that landed on each person, and the Christians went out to do amazing things. They spoke in languages that they didn't know before. Peter got up, declared the first sermon, thousands of people came to faith, and the apostles went out to do some um, some supernatural feats. They were able to cast out demons. They were able to proclaim the gospel to those who who killed Jesus. They were able to persevere under the threat of death. God empowered them to do what they couldn't do by themselves. And this essential truth is what we're going to be leaning into as we talk about love for today. You see, the Spirit of God enables me to do what I can't do by myself. And likewise, the Spirit of God empowers you to do what you can't do by yourself. And as we consider love, we're considering how God might move us to love in a way that is beyond what we would naturally do by ourselves. So I want to talk a little bit about some questions that pop up as we talk about this topic. I mean, how is spirit-enabled love different from the love that all of us know as human beings. 
So we're going to talk about basically three things to answer this question. Love and the human spirit. Love and the spirit of God. And the challenge of love for today. God's challenge to love in our culture today. So uh, let's begin with the first topic. Have you ever wondered why love can be so moving and so attractive? Have you ever wondered why love is so important to us as humans? Why people will walk 500 miles just to be with the one they love? <laughs> why after thousands of years we're still singing and writing songs about love, dancing about love, writing poetry about love? And it's not just romantic love that we find so captivating. Why is it that we are so moved when we behold testimonies like Mother Teresa and her Sisters of Mercy loving those who have been abandoned on the streets? Or why is it that we find the vision of Dr. Martin Luther King and his beloved community so compelling? Well, Scripture gives us an understanding of why this is so. In the beginning, it says that God created humanity. God made the universe and planted human beings in the middle of it to take care of it, to steward it in, in a sense. He made men and women in his image. Certainly in the book of Genesis, being made in the image of God carried the idea of being God's representatives. We were designed to be God's representative in his created order. But it also means that we were created to love. Because at the center of who God is, we find love. Without love, God says we are nothing. Anything that we do is essentially worthless if we don't have love. Love is basic to who God is. And when we love and when we see acts of love and when we behold love in action, it moves us because that's how God has designed us to live. We are magnetically drawn to love because that resonates with a deep part of who we are as God's creation. But the story of love is also complicated by the fact that early on in human history, we fell away from God. We rebelled against God. We walked against the way that God showed us to live. And in so doing, we invited two new realities into the human experience, sin and death. Now, sin and death, we mention quite often here at Access, but it's important to understand that they are not just moral choices that went wrong. Uh, by sinning, it wasn't just choosing A over B or B over A and somehow making God angry. You see, when we got involved in sin, it created a de-evolutionary process. It was like a force that began to devastate our souls. And so choosing a life against sin isn't just about making better choices in life. It is about moving against this power that is in our lives that keeps ruining us and moving us toward death. That's why in Romans it talks about who will save us. Paul laments how he's captivated by sin and needs the power of God to deliver him. So sin has perverted and ruined love. So many things that we think are love are actually a perversion of what it was designed to be. Like lust. Lust, we think we're loving, but we're really acting out selfish desires that fail to honor another person. Or our hunger and our desire for love is perverted and we begin to think uh, that maybe we can receive it through consumer goods or our careers or we chase after it from from bad relationships. This is the world that we live in today. We recognize and long after love, but we fail miserably to live it out. And this takes us to our next point for today. Love and the Spirit of God. The gospel is the good news that God has come to save us through his Son, Jesus Christ. He sent his son Jesus to come and teach us the way of love. And then he took on our sin and our shame and our guilt. He went to the cross, died on our behalf, taking these things to the grave. 
Then on the third day, God raised him from the dead. And the offer and the invitation of God is this. If you put your faith and your trust in Jesus, you can be part of God's new creation process. You can join in the kingdom of God. And the Holy Spirit of God empowers you to live a new kind of life. It's important for us to emphasize this as we begin this discussion around love because we're not just trying to manufacture love when it's not there. We're trying to move into the way of God and allow the Spirit of God to transform our hearts to love beyond what our limits have been before. So there's a passage in Ezekiel that we referenced a few weeks ago that talks about this very thing. Ezekiel chapter 36, 25 to 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So this is what we're trying to do together in 2021. We're paying closer attention to the Spirit of God and learning to live by the Spirit as it moves us to love beyond our limits. For some of you, this is regaining something that may have been lost during the pandemic. You know, over the last year, it's been full of discouragements of all all sorts. And maybe you have felt your heart in a way closing up or feeling more cold And my prayer is that you'll find in this verse and in this teaching theme for 2021 a energy and a power to live beyond what you lived before. For some of you, maybe you're newer to this message. You're new in the faith. And this is really the core of discipleship, learning that you have a new identity in Christ and you are given the power of the Holy Spirit to go and live this new life. I'm excited for all that's ahead of us in terms of how we might exercise a new life in the Spirit. And one of the surprising things that I have discovered about love along the way is that it's expansive. It continues to grow. And it's not limited resources that we run out of But as we tap into the Spirit of God, it grows all the more. You know, I remember when we were having our second daughter, Mia. Uh, My wife, Amy, and our daughter, Emmy, the three of us were quite happy and in a loving relationship. And when I discovered we were going to have another daughter, I was a little nervous at first because I wasn't sure how I could love someone else just as much as I loved my first daughter. But lo and behold, when she entered into our lives, and when I beheld Mia, and when I began to hold her and began to parent her, I felt my heart soften and melt. And I discovered over time that love is expansive, especially the love that we know from God. It's generative. It grows. And it can include more and more people under its care. And I pray that this would be some of our heart this year in 2021, as we learn to live by the Spirit of God, that this expansive effect that the Holy Spirit can have in our lives as we learn to love may take root, and we may learn to live beyond our limits. And this leads us now to our challenge for today, love and the challenge of God. There's a challenge that comes to us as Jesus unfolded his ministry and taught about love. It comes to us in Matthew chapter 5. I want to read it today and pay close attention to how Jesus laid out the specifics of his love in his kingdom. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The challenge that Jesus gives us is loving our enemies. And I admit, reading these verses over the years that I've been a Christian have always made me feel uncomfortable because I know I don't measure up. I know that order is so tall, I, I really wonder if I can make it, if I can do this, if this is a possibility. But I'm also reminded that Jesus didn't just lay this out as a teaching. He lived it as an example. You see, when Jesus went to the cross, when he was unfairly arrested, when he was mocked and beaten down, and then nailed to a cross and his clothes were stripped from him, what did he declare from the cross as he was hanging in front of his oppressors and his persecutors and killers? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when I look to that example and I follow Christ in this way, I am pressed even deeper into this challenge. I can't do this, not on my own, but Jesus has created the way and he lived this out and he gives me his Holy Spirit to do differently. You know, over this past week, we celebrated Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. To remember his legacy, I thought I'd do some reading this year uh, and did some Google searches and I came up with something surprising. It involved Governor George Wallace, the man who famously opposed Dr. King's march for voters' rights in Alabama, the man who was known for saying segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And he was a man who was famous for this photo, uh, for opposing black students trying to enter into the University of Alabama, even after segregation was outlawed. Dr. King at one point stated that Wallace was perhaps the most dangerous racist in America. But what I didn't know about George Wallace was that there was more to his story. See, in the 1970s, Wallace was increasing in popularity, and he started making a run to be the Democratic nominee for President of the United States. However, one day while he was conducting business in Maryland, he was shot. He was shot five times, and one of the bullets was lodged in his spine, and from that day forward, he was never able to walk again. At the time, running against him politically was a congresswoman named Shirley Chisholm from New York. She was the first black woman elected into Congress and the first black woman to eventually run for president. When Congresswoman Chisholm heard about what happened to George Wallace, she stopped her campaign, which really angered her staffers and her supporters at the time. And she decided to go visit him in the hospital. They were thinking, now why in the world would she visit this long-standing racist who has caused so much pain and suffering on the black community? And this is how George Wallace's daughter goes on to describe it later on. She and Daddy talked real low, remembered Peggy. They prayed together, and Daddy asked her, what are your people going to say about you being here? She told him it didn't matter. I would not want this to happen to anyone. Daddy's face changed. It was just something that came over him. I think a seed was planted that day. Daddy was overwhelmed by her truth and her willingness to face the potential negative consequences of her political career because of him, something he had never done for anyone else. Years later, George Wallace would go on to denounce his racist views and his own acts that he had 
done to cause so much pain on the African-American community. He went and asked for forgiveness from various civil rights leaders and from different black communities, including civil rights leaders Ralph Abernathy and John Lewis. As governor, he would also go on to appoint a record number of African-Americans to positions of state power. People would later write about him that he was a man who changed not only by his words, but by his deeds. George Wallace's daughter describes a time later on when he visited a black church on a Sunday morning to share his message of repentance. On a Sunday in 1979, Daddy's arrival to this church was unannounced and unexpected, but for an attendant rolling his wheelchair to the front of the sanctuary, he was alone. What the congregation must have thought when he said, I've learned what suffering means in a way that was impossible. I think I can understand something of the pain that black people have come to endure. I know I contributed to that pain, and I can only ask for your forgiveness. And as he was leaving the church, the congregation began singing Amazing Grace. I share this story with you today to help us understand, you see, that the challenge that Jesus gives us is not there just to make you feel bad or inept or not measuring up. It's because it's in this challenge that Jesus has given us a way forward beyond the human mess that we live in. It's through this powerful love, even love for enemies, that we can bring healing and wholeness and redemption to this world. This is the way of Jesus. You have heard it said, love your neighbors and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Dr. Martin Luther King put it this way. What a magnificent lesson. Generations will rise and fall. Men will continue to worship the God of revenge and bow before the altar of retaliation. But ever and again, this noble lesson of Calvary will be a nagging reminder that only goodness can drive out evil. And only love can conquer hate. There's a second reason why I've shared this message with you today, this story from the civil rights era. Because today, our nation feels as divided as ever. We are so torn up over race and political divisions that it's hard to see a way forward. I found a poll um, done by CBS this past week that had this statistic. Very interesting look at what Americans perceive as the greatest threat. The biggest threat to America's way of life, says 54% of Americans, is other people in America. And this is more than twice as much the answered um, about their economic forces causing disasters, or even the coronavirus, which is around 17%. I think this is crazy, because think about it. The coronavirus is listed third, and yet the coronavirus has claimed over 400,000 lives in the United States and over 2 million lives worldwide. That is a serious threat. But in America today, we see neighbor as potential threat, even above the virus. This is a real problem. And one of my concerns for the church in America is that it takes on the same perspective of the world, learning to see neighbor as threat. Because at the core of our faith, we are called to love God with all that we have, and we're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. So as we wrap up today, what I'd like to do is take some time for personal assessment and ask several questions. And this may not feel like enough when it comes to loving neighbor and loving enemy, but we have a year to explore this together. And I think it's vital that we do a little bit of self-work and self-assessment before we jump into trying to love the way that Jesus taught us to love. 
We're not trying to do this by our own energy and by our own manufactured willpower. We're trying to do this by the Spirit. And maybe the Spirit needs to bring some conviction before we move forward. So here are those questions. Are there people that you see as enemies or threats to your life today? And what kind of response do you feel welling up in your heart as you think about them? What next steps might God want you to take to love your enemies? And what do you need from God to learn to love more deeply? As we wrap up our message, like I said, I'd like to repeat our theme verse today to remind us of this resource that we've been given in God, that we have the Holy Spirit moving us forward. So let's say this together. For the Spirit God gave me does not make me timid, but gives me power, love, and self-discipline. For the Spirit God gave me does not make me timid, but gives me power, love, and self-discipline. And one more time, let's repeat this together. For the Spirit God gave me does not make me timid, but gives me power, love, and self-discipline. Amen. And now, church, let's recite our sending prayer together today. Loving God, through all our years. Let the church be a community where we learn about love and practice it, where we envision peace and work to build it, where we meet partners in faith who wish to abandon everything that cheapens our discipleship, where we discover gifts and offer them. May your spirit guide us toward joy and generosity. In Jesus' name, in the way of Jesus. Amen. Hey XS, it's John. Um, I know a lot of us are totally zoomed out by now, um, but it's still our hope uh, that everyone at Access would be connected to life-giving community. And so I wanted to give you a nudge to check out our groups this semester uh, and sign up for one if you haven't already. But I know it can be a little bit hard to know like what are the groups about, so I wanted to just uh, share a little bit about each group. So first we have the Asian American Identity Group. Um, this is really a follow-up to the groups that um, uh, Phoebe and Pastor Grace led uh, a couple semesters ago. And in this group, they're going to be utilizing a multi-stage model um, geared specifically for Asian Americans to develop identity and awareness uh, and understanding in how, uh, what our specific role is in the work of racial racelessness and justices. And so that should be a really fantastic group uh, to check out. Uh, the second group is a women's Bible study group being led by Tina. Uh, I'm super excited about this group. They're going to be going through um, the Beatitudes using a John Stott book. Uh, but more than that, I know Tina's heart and vision is to bring women together, not just to study the Word, but to really pray for one another and encourage each other. 
And then uh, Josh and Isaac will be uh, facilitating a book study on the book Stranger God, uh, a book by Richard Beck, which explores uh, the concepts and themes of hospitality, particularly hospitality to people who are different than us. And wow, I can't think of a more, uh, I guess, relevant topic right now, uh, given our political climate. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to be leading a call to commitment group. Uh, Jessica Lewis will be helping me facilitate this as well. And um, this came out of our work. Uh, this has come out of our work with the church that unites diverse people. And in this group, this six week group, we're going to be exploring the four L's of uh, racial righteousness, uh, learning to listen, lament, uh, learn and leverage. So I really hope you'll consider joining that group as well. Um, Tiffany Square are coming back again this semester to lead uh, the multi-ethnicity through the Eyes of Moses group. This is a fascinating book study through the book of Exodus where uh, participants will be in the word and also learning about their ethnic identity with Moses as an example. We also have some new BSF groups um, that we wanted to publicize. So a number of you are involved in the Bible Study Fellowship which has an excellent approach, a very rigorous approach to studying the scriptures. Uh, and several of our members are lead groups um, and are, are deeply involved in leadership there. And so we wanted, they wanted to make those groups available to the whole Access community. So uh, Caleb and Howard both lead a men's BSF group that they wanted to invite you to. Uh, Josh is a, a co-teacher and trainer in one of the groups. So please check that out if you're interested. And last but not least, um, uh, I, Dave Tian, and Jeff Armstrong will be um, organizing a men's fellowship and prayer uh, group, uh, so to speak. And what we'll be doing is once a month, um, our hope is to be able to gather men together in the access parking lot, socially distance with masks safely, um, to have some time of fellowship, seeing each other, and then we'll break up into smaller groups uh, for prayer, uh, sharing encouragement from the word, um, and then just hopefully uh, being iron, shepherding iron. So um, I, I hope you'll consider checking that out as well. So those are some of our groups uh, this semester. Please go online to learn more and to sign up. Many groups start next week, so you'll want to be sure to sign up uh, as soon as possible. Thanks a lot.